Leonard in the forecourt of the Church of St. Peter on Vatican Hill in Rome. It's Christmas Day here in the Eternal City, but this usually joyous occasion may turn out to be a bitter disappointment. For on this Christmas morning in the year 800, Charlemagne, king of the Franks and ruler of Western Europe, was to have become the emperor of Rome. But Charlemagne's absence up to this moment seems to revive a previous rumor that the king will not attend the Christmas mass at which he was to be offered the crown by Pope Leo III. Disappointment has spread among this huge crowd waiting for the procession to begin, quenching their holiday spirit. The intense anticipation with which these people gathered has turned to gloom. Christmas Day of the year 800 in Rome. You are there. Amid the pageantry of Christmas in Rome, Pope Leo III waits to offer Charlemagne the crown of the vast Roman Empire. CBS takes you back 1149 years to a turning point in the history of Rome and of the world. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. With all the modern facilities of radio present, and CBS newsmen reporting from the scene, You are there. You are there is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now, Christmas Day in the year 800. The Church of St. Peter in Rome and Bill Leonard. As we reported earlier, the decision to offer Charlemagne the crown was made only two days ago at a conclave of Roman nobles and prelates. Then came the rumor that Charlemagne's council was pressing him to refuse. It was thought that the Frankish king would disregard his counsel and accept the crown from Pope Leo until he failed to appear here this morning. As you know, the marble, marble portico where we're standing opens into the forecourt of the Church of St. Peter. This portico is the traditional starting point of the annual Christmas procession into the great basilica. Pope Leo is waiting in his chambers inside the church. He won't emerge until Charlemagne arrives, if he arrives. The king at his, is at his temporary residence, the Castle of San Angelo, directly below us. So over to the Castle of San Angelo, Don Hollenbeck reporting. The sentries here won't let anyone into the castle to speak to the king's secretary, Egenhard. However, I have been able to learn that a last-minute conference is going on inside. Charlemagne's council is making an 11th-hour effort to dissuade him from attending this mass. Gregorius, Cardinal Bishop of Ostia, was here just a few moments ago to see Charlemagne. He came at the behest of Pope Leo. There's nothing else to report right now. I'll stand by and keep you posted if something does develop. This is Don Hollenbeck. Now back to Bill Leonard. The spectators here are beginning to show impatience. There are thousands of people between this portico and the entrance to St. Peter's and... Some of them are shouting for Charlemagne. They want Charlemagne to be crowned emperor. That, that would regain for Rome her place as capital of the Roman Empire, the place Rome lost five centuries ago to the new Rome of Constantine, now called Constantinople, of course. These people don't pay any attention to the fact that the Empress Irene in Constantinople is the nominal ruler of the empire because Rome has achieved virtual independence under the protectorship of the Frankish king. The people of Rome are eager now to renounce their allegiance to Irene and elevate Charlemagne, emperor of all Rome, in her place. Cardinal Gregorius has just returned from his audience with Charlemagne. The cardinal is tall, slender, aesthetic looking. Our CBS special events director is speaking to him now. The cardinal nods. He's walking this way. Cardinal Gregorius, your eminence, it's very good of you to grant us an interview, sir. Not at all, my son. Your Eminence, you've spoken with Charlemagne. Will the King attend the Mass today? The King has not yet decided. Is it true, Cardinal, that Charlemagne's council is urging him not to attend? Yes. The council urges him not to accept the crown? Yes. Well, do you think Charlemagne will follow their advice? Let us pray that Charlemagne will overrule his misguided advices and come forth. He must. He must honor the oath he has sworn to defend Christendom against her enemies. But your eminence Charlemagne is already the ruler of Western Europe and the protector of Rome. My son, the barbarians threaten from the Norseland. The Saracens attack us from Spain. Their raiders pillage the coast of Italy itself. 
Constantinople is far away. And Empress Irene is a woman. These infidels regard her rule over vast regions of the Roman Empire as a sign of Christian weakness. It encourages them to attack. But if, if Charlemagne accepts the crown, your eminence, wouldn't that be a usurpation of Irene's authority? Usurpation? That Jezebel, that corrupt, iniquitous woman, she is the usurper. How did she come to the throne? By stabbing out the eyes of her own son, the Emperor Constantine. By murder. Legally, the throne is vacant. Well, does the Pope have the authority to bestow the crown on Charlemagne? My son, His Holiness Pope Leo is God's vicar on earth. There can be no higher authority than that of the Holy Fathers. And now I must join my colleagues, if uh, you will excuse me. Thank you, Cardinal Gregorius. His eminence is joined a group of fellows nearby. As you heard, the Cardinal has challenged Empress Irene's legal right to sit on the throne. CBS reporter Larry Lasseur is standing by in Constantinople, and we'll take you there for comment as soon as arrangements have been completed. We can, we can just barely hear trumpets down below in the courtyard of the castle of San Angelo. What's happening there, Don? Over to Don Hollenbeck. Charlemagne will attend the Christmas Mass. I'll repeat that important news. Charlemagne will attend the Christmas Mass. He's just emerged from the great circular castle. The king is flanked by his royal bodyguard, shields on their left arms, their swords clanking at their sides. They're striding now along the colonnade that extends up Vatican Hill to the forecourt of St. Peter's. And this may very well mean that the king, against the advice of his counselors, has decided to accept the crown. Charlemagne's dressed in Roman costume, and that may be another sign that he has decided to become emperor of the Romans. He wears an embroidered toga, a white tunic over it, and he wears Roman sandals. In front of the king march about 50 Frankish nobles. They're resplendent in fine linen and furs. The soldiers, I can still see them. They're marching in perfect unison. These are picked troops, veterans of the victorious campaigns against the Saxons, the Mongols, and the Lombards. And now they've come to a halt near the end of the colonnade. Charlemagne proceeds alone, and in a moment or two, he'll have reached the portico in the forecourt of the church. So back to the portico and Bill Leonard. church a few moments ago and has arrived to meet Charlemagne. He wears the white cassock and pallium of his office on his head. I can see the golden paper crown suspended from his neck by a chain of gold with a large golden cross studded with jewels. King bows his head. He and the Holy Father touch cheeks in the ceremonial embrace. Pax Domini Divi. Et cum spiritu tuo. Pope Leo has greeted Charles, who replies in a traditional manner. Now the Pope turns to the leader of the Scola Cantorum. He, he nods. The leader motions to the choir. Holy is chanting Hodie Christus Natus Est. The choir will be the first group and now the procession begins. The choir is starting to move into the courtyard towards the Basilica of St. Peter. The other contingents of the procession, clergy and laity, fall into line behind the choir. It's a brilliant scene. Sumptuously attired nobles of Rome and Franklin, the hierarchy in white, black, purple, and crimson are Moving there with slow and solemn step. By tradition, Pope Leo, accompanied by Charlemagne, will be the last to join in the procession. It will be some time before they reach the church. The procession must pass through that mass of worshippers and spectators who are jamming every inch of the great courtyard. Jack Walters is out there at the far end of the courtyard near the entrance of the church. So over to Jack Walters. to get a glimpse of the procession, which is still some distance away. 
news of Charlemagne's appearance has overjoyed this crowd. They're shouting, long live the Pope, long live the King. People here take it as a sure indication that he'll agree to the coronation. With me is a woman who got here about 6 o'clock this morning to get a place in the front row of spectators. Would you tell us your name, please, ma'am? Uh, I am Donna Hera. I, uh, I make gowns for the best-dressed ladies of Rome. The newest styles and the finest materials and workmanship, even if I do say so myself. Oh, it seems this? I design clothes for the noblest women. I beg your pardon. Mm -hmm. Donna Hera, I, I assume you know His Holiness will offer Charlemagne the crown today? Oh, yes, and I'm delighted. I don't approve of women holding public office. Especially a woman like Irene of Constantinople. You know what they say about her morals. Our ruler should be a man. Especially a man like Charlemagne. He's so handsome. Of course, it'd be a good thing for business, too. For business? Oh, yes, yes. If Charlemagne were emperor, the imperial court would be here in Rome. That would be good for the Roman merchants. My ladies could then order as many new gowns as they liked. Thank you, Donna Hurd. Yes. Now, here's a man... Judging from the dust on his clothes, I guess he's come a long distance to be here today. Is that correct, sir? Yes, from Sicily I've come. The island of Sicily, that is a long way. Would you tell us your name, please? Donatus, sir. Now, Donatus, do you want Charlemagne to become emperor? Yes. Why? Because I'm a farmer. Yes? Because we Sicilians are subjects of Constantinople. Our governor is appointed by the Empress Irene. Go on. Because the governor, centralist, steals the bread from our mouths. No matter how large our harvests, our bellies are empty. Because the governor's tax collectors rob us. But do not as if Charlemagne becomes emperor, it may take a war to drive Irene's governor out of Sicily. Would the Sicilian peasants be willing to fight to liberate your island? Yes. I too, we must. Well, Donatus, perhaps your island of Sicily will soon see better times. Thank you. The huge crucifix born at the vanguard of the procession is still some distance away. Don Hollenbeck at Charlemagne's residence, the castle of St. Angelo, has arranged for an interview with Count Egenhard, a member of Charlemagne's staff. So, over now to Don Hollenbeck. Count Egenhard, who's here with me at our CBS microphone, is one of Charlemagne's chief advisors and his personal secretary. He didn't accompany the king to St. Peter's because he's confined to his apartment here with the leg injury incurred during the journey to Rome. Count Egenhard, does Charlemagne's decision to escort Pope Leo to St. Peter's mean that he will accept the crown of the Roman Empire? No. Absolutely no. Not at all. We um, wanted to avoid such unfounded speculation. That is why we urged His Majesty not to go to St. Peter's. Well, then, what was Charlemagne's reason for going? His Majesty is a pious Christian. By attending St. Peter's, he's merely uh, fulfilling his Christian duty. Now, does that mean that Charlemagne will reject the crown if it's offered? It does. That's an official statement, sir? It is, yes. Absolutely. Well, now, that's the first official word we've had from the Frankish court on the question of whether Charlemagne will accept or refuse the crown. And now, if I may ask this next question, sir, why have Charlemagne's advisors counseled him against accepting the crown? Well, that is simple, quite simple. As matters now stand, His Majesty is clearly supreme in all uh, temporal matters, just as the Pope has been supreme in purely spiritual affairs. Now, if His Majesty accepted the imperial crown from the hands of Pope Leo, it would imply that the church was supreme, even in the political sphere. It would imply that Charlemagne owed his imperial title and powers to the Pope. And you're afraid that might set a precedent for the future? A dangerous precedent, very dangerous. Based on such a precedent, the Pope might, in the future, claim the right to choose the emperor. The imperial title would become meaningless. We would have rule not by royalty, but by the ecclesiastic authority. That would be as bad as having an emperor name the Pope. Well, now, is that what Charlemagne has in mind in refusing the crown? <clears throat> well, I will say this. His Majesty is aware of the danger. He will not permit such a situation to arise. And there is another danger. The danger of war, bloodshed. Constantinople would consider the coronation a threat to Empress Irene's throne. 
And the Empress Irene would not hesitate to employ a military force to protect her empire. But, Count Egenhard, surely there's nothing to be afraid of in that direction. Charlemagne has certainly demonstrated his military genius often enough. Yes, that is true. But above all, Charlemagne is a great statesman. He will not resort to war to obtain something which can be obtained by a peaceful negotiation. Negotiations with Constantinople? Exactly. Negotiations are already in progress. But, but do you suppose the Empress Irene will yield her immensely rich empire by negotiation? Well, she's not being asked to yield. Only to uh, arrange matters in a manner which will be uh, beneficial to both parties. Yes, but how can I'm we... uh, not at liberty to comment on that. Any uh, additional information will be forthcoming in due time from the... Uh, uh, royal party is concerned. And now, if you'll pardon me... Thank you very much, Count Egenhardt. As you've heard, a source that's considered to be highly authoritative states that Charlemagne will, under no circumstances, accept the crown from Pope Leo today. According to Count Egenhardt, Charlemagne has chosen the path of negotiation with the Empress Irene. We don't know yet just what those negotiations involve. This is Don Hollenbeck at the Castle of San Angelo. Now back to Bill Leonard at the far end of the forecourt of St. Peter's. Pope Leo and the ministers of the Mass, the last members of the procession, are about to leave this portico. Charlemagne is walking behind the prelates through the throng of spectators toward the Church of St. Peter. As we've heard, according to Count Egenhardt, it appears almost certain that Charlemagne will, will not be crowned today. If Pope Leo offers Charlemagne the crown, it will be publicly refused. It, it hardly seems likely the Pope would risk a public rejection. Such a rebuff on a high holiday in full view of all Rome would reflect badly on the prestige of the Pope. So it's possible that the crown may not be offered at all. Communications with Constantinople have now been arranged. We hope we may soon know more about Charlemagne's negotiations with Empress Irene. CBS correspondent Larry Lester is standing by in the Imperial Palace. With him is Nicephorus, Empress Irene's Chancellor. We take you now to Constantinople. Larry Lester reporting. Charlemagne's secretary, Count Egenhardt, has just stated in Rome that negotiations are underway with Empress Irene. Would you care to comment on the nature of these negotiations, sir? No comment. But your excellency... If you please. Her Majesty has ordered me to communicate her attitude on the situation in Rome. Yes, your excellency, but... Charlemagne has a profound understanding of the affairs of empire. We are convinced he must be aware that Pope Leo is offering a crown which is not his to give. The rule of the empire is hereditary. When the line of succession fails, the only body on earth Empowered to name the emperor is the Eastern Roman Senate. And that Senate is here in Constantinople. It's been here for 500 years. Only recently did the Senate ratify the succession of Empress Irene to the throne. Her Majesty, therefore, is the sole ruler of the empire. In her person resides the imperial might and glory of Rome. There can be no other. Well, getting back to those negotiations, Your Excellency, according to Charlemagne's secretary... Eckhart, I am not authorized to speak on negotiations which Her Majesty may or may not be conducting. Oh, now you'll, you must excuse me. Her Majesty has returned from the Holy Liturgy. I, uh, I must go to meet her. Chancellor Nicephorus has hurried out of the room. He's going to the palace entrance. And as he said, the Empress is in the palace courtyard, surrounded by her bodyguard. I can see her through an open window. She stepped out of her chariot. She's walking toward the palace entrance over a rich purple carpet unrolled by servants in front of her to protect her feet from the ground. The empress is now 48 years old, of course, but she retains much of her famous beauty. 20 years ago, when she married the late emperor, Irene was considered one of the most beautiful women in the world. The empress is still youthfully slim, and there are no signs of gray in her jet black hair. She's passed through the palace entrance and now out of sight. The bodyguard cavalry have mounted their horses, and now they ride out of the courtyard. The royal chariot, however, it remains behind. It's truly an amazing vehicle, that chariot, made of hammered gold, drawn by six six-book white horses. The reins of each horse are held by a noble, and when the chariot is in motion, those nobles run alongside on foot. Irene, Empress of the Romans. The Empress has entered the room. She's coming towards the microphone. Your Majesty. Her Majesty desires to make an announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, Her Majesty the Empress. 
citizens and subjects of the empire. We have heard reports that Charlemagne, king of Frankland, will attempt to claim our throne. Nothing, we say nothing, could be further from the truth. To silence forever, this malicious canard we hereby announce that Charlemagne has made representations petitioning our hand in marriage. The negotiations are well advanced, proceeding in a favorable atmosphere. We are confident that Charles of the Franks will soon share our throne in marriage. In this union, Eastern and Western Christendom will be united and prosper. Ladies and gentlemen, CBS has just brought you an exclusive statement by Her Majesty the Empress Irene. Now we know. We know why Charlemagne seems to have decided not to accept the crown from Pope Leo in Rome today. It would certainly appear unlikely that Charlemagne will accept it all, at least while these delicate and tremendously important negotiations with Constantinople are in progress. This is Larry Lesser in Constantinople. Back now to Bill Leonard in Rome. <laughs> Speaking now from our broadcasting booth in the nave of the Church of St. Peter, the crown, the crown with which Pope Leo hopes to make Charlemagne Emperor of Rome is here in the church. We, we saw it as soon as we entered. It's in plain view, resting on a velvet pillow on a credence table near the altar of St. Peter. It seems that in spite of everything we heard, in spite of all the evidence that Charlemagne will not accept, it appears that Pope Leo will make the offer and risk a public refusal. The crown is a worthy symbol of empire. It's richly wrought, solid gold, resplendent with precious jewels. The main body of the procession is already here and fills the center section of this great church. The choir of the Schola Cantorum and the prelates have taken up their places in the sanctuary. The Roman nobles are standing on the left side of the choir section. On the right are the Frankish counts. Everyone is awaiting the arrival of His Holiness and Charlemagne. Charlemagne has entered. He's entered. He's passed through the great portal leading from the narthex, the vestibule of the church, walking with measured tread down the nave toward the sanctuary of the church. All eyes are on Charlemagne. Everyone here has seen the crown. They must be wondering how the Pope will go about making the offer of the crown and what Charlemagne's reaction will be. They must also be wondering how a public rebuff, a rebuff that's now considered inevitable, will affect relations between the Pope and the protector of Rome. Charlemagne has reached the sanctuary. He kneels at a, kneels at a prayer stool below the altar, a spot traditionally reserved for royalty. He's praying. And now the Scola Cantorum is chanting the Eches of Sheridos, Magnus, Behold the Mighty Priest. sanctuary in the shrine of St. Peter. The shrine, you know, contains the relics of the great apostle. Stands over the very spot where he was crucified by the emperor Nia. Pope Leo has now reached the foot of the altar. The mass is about to begin. The Pope seems to be, seems to be hesitating. He has not yet made the sign of the cross. His head is bowed. 
to the Pope's hands stretching forward with the crown. Charlemagne looks up now. Everyone here is watching, spellbound, waiting, waiting for Pope Leo to speak, to make the formal offer. We don't know what we're... Pope, Pope Leo has placed the crown on Charlemagne's head. He has crowned Charlemagne without asking leave to do so. This, this is, this is completely unexpected. The congregation gasps in stunned silence. Rise, my son. Charlemagne, Charlemagne rises. The king appears bewildered by the suddenness of the Pope's bold action. Pope Leo's about to speak. Charles, protector of Rome, king of Franklin, ruler of Saxon, the Lombard, I crown you emperor of the Romans. Repeat after me the oath of investiture. I, Charles, emperor, in the presence of God, where to protect and defend the Holy Roman Church in all things to the best of my ability. Charlemagne is silent. He is not repeating the oath. His face is expressionless. He can still undo the Pope's act by removing the crowd from his head. Charlemagne can still repudiate his coronation. I Charlemagne is speaking. Emperor. In the presence of God, swear to protect and defend the Holy Roman Church to the best of my ability. Long life and victory to Charles, by God's crown, Emperor of the Roman. Standing there, erect, proud, the imperial crown is flashing on his head. The worshippers thronging this great basilica are exalted. The Scola Cantorum is singing the Gloria, a hymn of jubilation and thanks to the Almighty. Christmas Day in the year 800, Charlemagne is crowned emperor of the Roman and Rome enters the new You've been listening to The Crowning of Charlemagne in the series You Are There. Today's program was written by Michael Sklar, directed by John Dietz, and produced by the CBS Documentary Unit under the supervision of Werner Michel. Charlemagne was played by Guy Sorel. Joseph DeSantis was Pope Leo III. Abby Lewis was Empress Irene. Ian Martin was Count Egenhard, and Charles Webster was Cardinal Gregorius. Others in the cast included Hester Sondergaard and Mercer McLeod. The choir, especially transcribed for this program, was conducted by Don Craig. You Are There is brought to you every fourth Sunday over most of these same stations. The next broadcast will be heard Sunday, January 22nd, 1950, but at a new time, at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Four weeks from today, at 4.30... September 1st, 1664. Peter Stuyvesant surrenders New Amsterdam to the British. You are there. Many of the new Christmas books that we have or will receive this year are historical novels and adventure tales about America's exciting past. It will give you new pride in your country to read about the men and women who were the builders of this great democracy. Perhaps we all take our liberty too much for granted. We don't realize that freedom can be lost without constant work and vigilance on the part of every one of us. Let's resolve to be better citizens this year. This is CBS, where our Miss Brooks holds classes every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System.